I'm just kidding. I will try not to go over. <clears throat> I'll begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you that uh, you came to earth and died for our sins. And we can have your righteousness instead of our own, Lord, and we thank you for that. And I just pray you bless this class, Lord, and just guide our thoughts, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so um, let me just get this numerical integration stuff out of the way. And then I'll take your questions about homework. So numerical integration is, what's that mean? I mean, sometimes I'll, you, you guys ask me a question like, I can't, I can't, like one of you said, I, I can't do the trigonometry on the intersection problem, problem 13, was it? 14, something like that. And I told you, well, you need to use a numerical method. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that you need to result to maybe like graphing, looking for an actual intersection by zooming in, or using some sort of, some, some sort of, some sort of a computer technique to actually solve the equations, right? You, closed form, um, pen to paper techniques sometimes don't work, right? Uh, there's lots of problems in the real world where we can't actually solve the equation. So in such a situation, we have to resort, resort to some sort of numerical, numerical method. Uh, there's a whole class here on numerical methods called Math 352, I think it is. Dr. Wang teaches this. Um, I would encourage you, if you're looking um, for like a math minor or something, you're trying to decide what, what course you want to take past you know, the required calculus courses, that's a really good choice because oftentimes in industry or applications, numerical method is all we can do. All right. Now, the bulk of our efforts in here is not on numerical methods. It's on closed form, yeah, closed form solutions, right? Because we're trying to understand as best as we can the simplest case, which is actually the case that you can work it out by hand. But when that fails, you have to resort to a numerical method, all right? So the numerical methods for integration that we cover in here are as follows. We cover um, the left endpoint rule, the right endpoint rule, the midpoint rule, um, the trapezoid rule, and I'll say a couple words on Simpson's rule. So, left, right, midpoint, trapezoid, and Simpson's. And um, the first three are exactly what they sound like. All right, so let me just explain. So what we're going to consider um, f of x uh, continuous <coughs> on some closed interval a to b. And our, our goal is basically to describe the integral from a to b of f of x dx um, approximate. Approximate this. All right. Now, I would remind you, before we even do anything else, what was the, what was the definition of the integral from A to B? Do you guys remember? It was the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum i equals 1 to n of f of x sub i star delta x, right? This was the so-called Riemann integral. So that, that's the precise definition. We have to take the limit as the number of sample points goes to infinity, right? If we, if we don't let the number of sample points go to infinity, well, then we get, we get approximations to the Riemann integral, all right? The, the first three that I've listed up here, left, right, and midpoint, are, are just exactly, exactly that. Okay, so let me get to it here, the setup. So first of all, we need to define the partition. What's a partition? So we'll say, we'll say A is equal to X naught 
and we'll say b is equal to x sub n. Delta x is going to be b minus a over, um, oh, excuse me. Yeah, no, b minus a over n. So what we're doing is we're going to take the, the closed interval from a to b and rewrite it as like x0 to x1 and then x1 to x2. Finally, we get to like the jth one, xj, comma, well, let me call it i, xi union xi plus 1. Finally, we get to um, xn minus 1 and then, and then xn. This guy is a, this guy is b. And so like here's some in-between ones. x1 is a plus delta x. x2 is a plus 2 delta x. Generically speaking, x sub i is a plus i copies of delta x. This is the setup. So here's a picture. If this is A, this would be like x1, x2, and then kind of think about some break in the graph. And then over here, xn minus 1, xn. So these points, these partition points are laid out sequentially and they're equal distance apart by my construction. They're all delta x apart, b minus a over n. Here we're thinking n could be, you know, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, whatever. And I need to set it up sort of generically. Hopefully I've done that. Now, so here's a picture, um, a function. I'll, I'll draw it like this. Here's y equals f of x. So let's start with ln, the left endpoint rule. How, what would the left endpoint rule, how could I picture it given this partition? So the way it works is you use the left endpoint of each subpartition. So like, um, oh, before I draw the picture and before I move on too far, you might wonder what x sub i star is. In terms of this notation over here, what's x sub i star? It's an element of what? It's an element of the i subinterval. So it's an element of x sub i minus 1 to x sub i. It's somewhere in there. All right? So if I'm looking, here's my x sub i minus 1. Here's x sub i. Well, somewhere, somewhere in this little subinterval, there's the sample point x sub i star. I'm not sure where it is. The Riemann integral says, I mean, part of the Riemann integral that we define in calculus one is it doesn't matter where you pick x sub i star. That choice is washed away in the limit as n goes to infinity. Because as n goes to infinity, the little subdivisions go to zero, and so it doesn't matter whether you cho choose that x sub i star to be the left point, the right point, the midpoint, or some point governed by the mean value theorem as we need in the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus. They all give you the same definite integral. This is definition, the definition of the Riemann integral. Now, okay, so what does my picture look like for the left endpoint rule? The left endpoint fixes the height, that's the rule. So. Left endpoint, like so. Left endpoint, like so, and so forth, all right? And then finally, these are supposed to be equal with, I, uh, uh. all right, so the left endpoint fixes the final, and so there you go. The area of the blue blue boxes describes ln. 
So what's the formula for ln? It's the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of f of x sub i delta x. This is ln. It starts with, you know, the, the height of the first one is f of a, which is f of x naught. The height of the last one is f of x sub n minus 1, all right? So you're going from the 0 to the n minus 1 sample point. This is the left endpoint rule. Another picture? All right, again, I'll draw my function kind of the same sort of thing. Now the right endpoint rule, what's that look like? Right endpoint rule, we use the right endpoint of each sample to fix the height of the box. Right? So what's the formula for the right endpoint rule? Almost the same thing, but what? Sum i equals 1 to n of f of xi delta x. This is the right endpoint rule. Now, for the function which I just gave you, is it, how would you rank, if you had to, you know, compare the, the integral, the actual honest to goodness integral from a to b, versus these approximations, ln and rn, how would they, how would they rank? So notice we have f prime of x is greater than 0 for a less than or equal to x, less than or equal to b. In other words, it's increasing. And what do we see in this case? You can see it in the picture, right? The left endpoint rule is an underestimate. The integral somewhere in between, right? And the right endpoint rule is a overestimate. Yep. And just to backtrack a little bit, so can you define this partition of A to B? Uh-huh. Could you just re-explain that to me? I didn't quite get that. The partition of A to B is we're just chopping the interval from A up A, A to B up into n equal subintervals. Okay. So Uh-huh. The user unions. A very good question. This means union. Those are all union, 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 union. <laughs> There's dot, dot, dots because I don't know how to write end things except without dot, dot, dots. X i to X. Yeah, so it's one x to be. We have X i to X i plus one. Right. So what is the difference between X i and one X n minus one X? Well, the n is fixed. X n is is fixed to be b. Like we're we're taking the the zeroth one is this a and b are fixed here. So like a is always X sub zero. B is always X sub n. But B could also be, like, B could be x10 if we have n equals to 10. B could be x100 if n is equal to 100, right? Um, but if, if n equals to 100, x10 would be like a tenth of the way over from A, you know? So x sub i comma x sub i plus 1 is just a generic subinterval in the middle somewhere. So this is the... Um, the left end point, the right end point, the midpoint, what do you think that is? If we do x bar i to be the midpoint, that's going to be one half of x i um, plus x sub i minus one. Right? So like x bar one 
is one half of x1 plus x sub zero, right? And so forth. The, um, the nth one is one half of x sub n minus one, or excuse me, x sub n plus x sub n minus one, you know, which, of course, that's a. So, you know, you can define midpoints of each one of these intervals, right? I can draw a picture. So, the midpoint is like it sounds, it's in the middle. So, like here's x bar 1, x bar 2, x bar n, right? You can pick midpoints for each subinterval. The midpoint rule says define the height of the approximating rectangle by the midpoint for each one. Um, so in my picture, I would use the midpoint. Govern the height of the box. So now, now we've. Um, I mean, in the limit as n goes to infinity, these all should give the same thing, right? They should all give. They should all go back to the definite integral. But now, if I ask you the question, this midpoint rule, right? If we tried to rank the midpoint rule. Where does it fit? Is it, I mean, relative to the left and the end point, left and the right endpoint rule? Where does the midpoint rule rank against the uh, integral? I mean, I think, yeah, it's where. It's yeah, it's either over or under, but it's definitely closer to the integral than either ln or rn. I'll agree with that. Right? How close is it? How close is the the midpoint rule? There's actually a theorem that bounds the error in the midpoint rule according to a specific estimate on the derivative of the function involved. I'll look that up and write it down here in a bit. But anyway, that's the midpoint rule. What's the formula for it? <laughs> it's the sum i equals 1 to n of f of the midpoint, x bar i delta x. All right. What's the trapezoid rule? <laughs> trapezoid rule. So I'll draw with a picture what's going on here. Again, we're um, going from x0 equal to a, then you got x1, you got x2, I'll go I'll x, x3 this time, and it goes on all the way out, and you get to the end of this. Let me attempt to draw, to draw a picture. Here's my y equals f of x. Now, what, what's the trapezoid rule say do? It says, draw little trapezoids under the graph and use the area of the trapezoid to approximate the definite integral. So, this one here, you go from here to there, connect the dots like that. From here to here, connect the dots like, and then from here to here, <laughs> my blue marker is becoming purple. I got too close into the red. <laughs> Oops. Let me let me draw it a little bit under it as it, I mean it's actually really really close. It's hard to make the I mean these the, these you can see that the trapezoid rule is going to be quite close to the actual integral unless your functions varying a lot relative to the integration domain. So what's the what's what's the area what's the area this this let's say area 1. What what's area 1 equal to? Do you know how to get the uh, area of a trapezoid like that? What, what you do is you take the average height and, divide, and multiply by the width. Does that make sense? I mean, if you think about it, you go, okay, well, I'm going to say one half 
of you know f of x1 plus f of x0 that's that's the average that's the average height like right in there so if I do that times the width that gives me the area does that make sense and likewise the area of the second trapezoid that would be f of x2 plus f of x1 So, you know, again, using the average height to get the area of the trapezoid. What happens when you add these? Do you see what's going to happen? The nth one looks like what? One half f of xn minus one. So add these. And we get tn is what? Well, if, I mean, we got some bookends, right? We got one half f of x zero plus two times f of x one plus two times f of x n minus one plus f of x n. Because we get we get double of every midpoint. Just the endpoints appear just once, right? So that is, by the way, a formula for the trapezoid rule that I just wrote. But oftentimes, you can calculate the trapezoid rule if you already know the left and end, left and right endpoint rules. How does the trapezoid rule relate to the left, ln and rn? So I'll just take. Uh, <laughs> you know, just pull off the x naught and one of the copies of the middle terms to create the ln, and pull off the xn and the other copy of the midterms to create the rn. That's ln plus rn. Yeah. So the trapezoid rule is also equal to oh, divided by two, right? The left endpoint rule plus the right endpoint rule divided by two. All right. So what's Simpson's rule? What is Simpson's rule? So we've approximated, you know, in the kind of most naive way by you know, just picking rectangular approximations or trapezoids, right? What's next? If you want to do approximate. The area under a curve. Any ideas? Next up is Simpson's rule. Simpson's rule says to approximate the area under the graph via parabolas. So Simpson's rule replace function with approximating parabolas. So the picture is something like this. Oh, and I need to be careful. Simpson's rule is only defined for 
even even number of um, even n. So let's go for x x four. It's okay. Well, now we're all awake. That's good. Let's see here. So um, you should really set that off during the convocations coming up. Let's see here. Oh no, did I say that? Let's see here. Oh no, I said that. Yes, sir. Um, so you can imagine like fitting little parabola, like bits of a parabola, right? A little bit of a parabola. Like there's a parabola that fits there. There's another one that fits here, right? There's some kind of different parabola that would fit like that. And if you fit the, you know, fit parabolas along the graph. Listen, I'm not even going to derive it. I'm just going to write the formula for you, okay? Um, and so here's Simpson's rule. It says S n is equal to delta. Oh, schnikes, come on. Delta x over 3, f of x naught plus 4 times f of x1 plus 2 times f of x2 um, plus 4 times f of x3, da 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 da, and so forth, and then plus. 2 times f of xn minus 2 plus 4 times f of xn minus 1 plus f of xn. Here, of course, delta x is b minus a over n, and n is even. If somebody says, do Simpson's rule for five points, you'd be like, no, give me six, or give me four, or shut up. We do Simpson's rule for an even number of points, all right, in order to make sense of this parabola fitting. Now, listen, um, there are built-in uh, functions into Mathematica or to any computer algebra, algebra system which will compute Simpson's rule for you. Um, if you take Math 352, I think one of the things you'll prove in there, or at least talk about, is that Simpson's rule in some sense is optimal. You might wonder, well, what if I fit cubic polynomials, quartic polynomials to my integral? Will that give me a faster convergence to the actual value of the integral? And the answer is no. Actually, this is kind of like the best of, this is best. The Simpson's rule is like the best way to approximate a numerical integral in this sense, <coughs> short of some other special circumstance. Um, so Simpson's rule actually converges to the answer faster. And so you say, well, what do you mean converges? Well, so we can talk about the error. What's the error in approximation? So here's the way it works. You take your approximation with n boxes or n, you know, n points minus the actual integral, theoretically, then this is equal to the error. So the error is the difference between your approximation and the, the actual integral. And there are theorems which bound the error for these different things. Let me tell you those right quick. These are not in my notes, but they're in your textbook. So, you know, fun facts. We could derive these, but if I did that, then I'd be liable to test you on that. So let me not do that. So the, um, I mean, this might be needed for your homework though. The error in the nth trapezoid rule is less than or equal to m times b minus a cubed over 12n squared. The error in Simpson's rule, all right, um, is less than or equal to m times b minus a to the fifth power over 
10 to the fourth. Now I need to tell you what the M is. Where the absolute value of F prime prime of X is less than or equal to M. Where the fourth derivative, prime 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 of X, is less than or equal to M for A less than or equal to X less than or equal to B. So these are the, the, uh, the error bounds in the trapezoid and the Simpsons rule. There's also an error bound for the midpoint rule. What's the error bound for the midpoint rule? Come on, you book. A. <laughs> well, that's annoying. <laughs> oh, man. Huh. Well, if it's in here, I'm not seeing it. I'm not looking at your book at the moment. I couldn't find it in my office. I mean, you don't have a book, right? My notes. I know it's not in my notes, all right? My notes have a discussion of these things. Um, but, all right, let's actually look at an example. So I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, um, words. They are in the midpoint rule for now. will have to remain a mystery. Let me look into it and I'll try to find the formula for you. I just don't, I don't have it in front of me. So let's actually uh, try this out here. <clears throat> let's try to integrate from say 0 to 4 sine of x squared dx. Can you do this integral? You're like, at this point, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm learning that I can integrate all kinds of crazy stuff I didn't think I could integrate before. But the truth of the matter is no. No matter of, no ma no manner, no amount of hacking away at this integral with the methods you've been shown will make this work. Right? Now to prove that is a problem in abstract algebra too and, and then some. There's an algorithm which will tell you whether or not a given function is, can be calculated with the methods of this course. There exists such an algorithm. But um, that's beyond the course, of course. All right, so let's say f of x um, is sine of x squared. Let's try to calculate this. Let's try to calculate the trapezoid rule. And to keep things relatively simple, let's use four, four, four rectangles. And the reason I did that is because I'm lazy. x0 equals to a 0. x1 equals to 1. x2 equals to 2. x3 equals to 3. x4 equals to 4. Well, thanks. You're like, great. Um, do you want me to make it more complicated? I could make it integral from 0 to 2 so you could see the step size of a half happening. OK, this is good. All right, good. This will work. All right, now, before I get any further, what's f prime of x? The f dx is what? Looks like 2x cosine of x squared, yeah? And what's f prime prime of x? Can you tell me a lazy bound? What, what, can, you, can you guys tell me this? What would f prime prime of x be um, bounded by? Absolute worst case scenario. Um, absolute worst case scenario would be this is 1, 
this is somehow minus 1, and x is what? What's the biggest x could be in here? Four, right? So if all of that happened, what would happen? Right, so this is definitely less than or equal to what? 66? That, that, is, that is a stupidly lazy bound. That actually cannot happen. You can't have cosine is 1 and sine is minus 1 at the same time. That's just not possible. If cosine is, is minus 1, sine is 0. If sine is 1, cosine is 0. That's the way they work. So, I know that's not possible, right? But that's definitely an upper bound on the second derivative. Um, so that would say that the error in the trapezoid for the trapezoid rule of four points is less than or equal to, what was my m? 66. I mean, that's a really lazy m. What's b minus a? Four. Oh, this is not going to be impressive. <laughs> four cubed. I mean, I'm sorry, this is not going to give us a very good error bound. 12 times my n was what? Uh, the n is four, right? So what's this equal to? 66 times 4 divided by 12, it looks like. Aw. I've been too lazy with my bound. Well, this is not going to be that impressive. I'm sorry. All right. Anyway, what's the left endpoint rule here? We'd have what? Sine, sine of 0 plus sine of 1 plus sine of 2 plus sine of 3. That would be L4, right? What's, what's R4? That's R4? What's the... the, the, the the trapezoid rule with four things. T4 equal to L4 plus R4 divided by 2, whatever that's equal to. Now, if I've given you homework on this, I don't really intend for you to do it by hand. All right? I really would like you to use Wolfram Alpha or something like that to do these. You're like, well, then how do you test on this? Well, that's actually very simple. I ask questions like this. See, because this just requires a qualitative understanding of what we're doing. If the function's increasing, then the left and the right endpoint rules should bound the actual integral like that, right? If, on the other hand, the function's decreasing, this story flips over, doesn't it? If the function was, if, you know, if the, if the, if the, if the, if f was looking like this, then if you look at the left endpoint rule, it does what? It over approximates, doesn't it? So there's, there's plenty of qualitative questions to ask about this material. I don't actually need to see, oh, can you actually sort through Simpson's rule for a finite number of points in time pressure and punch numbers into your calculator? What does that tell me? That's not a skill I care that you have. I want you to gain a qualitative understanding of these things, all right? Oh. Son of a motherless goat. Here we go. Six, six, seven, three. There you go. You know what time it is. Let's see here. Any of you guys watch Rhett and Link <coughs> on the YouTube? What's that? They haven't been good in years? Ah. They've been in California too long, is that the problem? I think so. Yeah. When I was at NC State, uh, as an undergraduate, they were the MCs for Campus Crusade for Christ. Or, 
the crew. Not then, though. Back then, we knew who we were. Let's see here. All right, come on. I mean, no better way to reach out to people than to remind them of the Crusades, right? Let's see here. No, I think it's wise that they've, you know, distanced themselves from that. Um, but anyway. So un unfortunately, I will tell you this. I think that the apps that I have pictures of in this, they, I think they died in the great security debacle of Java circa 2010. Like there was this, this security thing that just killed all of my Java, my favorite Java apps. It may or may not work anymore, the ones that I have actually taken screenshots of in here. Um, these guys, like I, I haven't had a chance to investigate. There, there are, I think if you Google Simpsons rule, classroom demonstration, you'll probably find something that works. Um, but come on. Mostly I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that we can straight calculate finite sums here. All right, check this out. So of course you can, yeah. Then you should print it out. So there you go, sine of one plus sine of four plus sine of nine. That is the left endpoint rule, right? And <laughs> uh, so elf, you know, 0 0.4967, well eight. And what's the right endpoint rule? We go from one to four. So we get 0 0.2089. So what's the trapezoid rule? <coughs> Now I'm going to get greedy. Come on. Oh man. This may or may not work. You know, Wolfram Alpha only takes so much before you pay it money. All right. Was that one? Was that, was that one step too far? Oh no! Yay! Point three five two eight is T four here. But yes, you are welcome to use this to set up RN, LN, so forth. Yes. And also, the fun thing here, of course, is we can actually integrate. Sine of x squared, ah, oops, from x equals 0 to x equals to 4. Wow. <laughs> wow, these are... These are, these are really bad. <laughs> How can we make them better? <laughs> what if we, let's see here. Um, if we use x sub i equal to, um, what, what's that, n? Did I make a mistake? Oh yeah. Well, that's not actually what I have here, though. <laughs> I mean, I yes, I wrote with, what I wrote on the board is not what I calculated. Those were I, I. I did sine of i squared. I didn't follow my own advice. Um, 
But if we do, um, you know, this is supposed to be what, i delta x? Um, well, a plus i delta x, but a here is 0, right? So x sub i being um, i times b, um, b over n. So x sub i is actually um, 4i over n. So what I'm trying to say here <laughs> is I could go back and I could maybe do better. Say sum, we'll do the right endpoint rule, okay? Sum i equals 1 to 100 of f of, what is x sub i if x is 100? It is, excuse me, sine of x sub i squared, which would be, what would it be? It would be, I've already forgot my formula, 4 4 i divided by 100. Square it, as you said, square it, right? Is sine of x squared, yeah? That should give me the, that's, that should be r100. Well, this is just not going well today. <laughs> oh, what if I forgot? I've covered it up, but what is the right endpoint rule? It's not just you know, there's something else that goes on, right? It's Rn, uh, something I forgot from my formula. Sum i equals 1 to n of f of x sub i star, delta x. What is delta x here, though? It's 4, yeah, 4 divided by 100. That's my delta x. Please, work. Work. Come on. I refuse to pay money. I'm trying to. So if we take 18.5. 18.5 times what? 4 divided by 100. Hopefully that will not choke Wolfram Alpha. 0.74, which is? Which is really close to this, right? But to appreciate the error bound, I'd have to take m larger. But we will talk more about error for more interesting things as we go on. So happy convo to you all. If you ask me if you're required to go, I have no idea. You're an engineer? You guys cut me off? Uh, not yet. <laughs>